Gonna do some acapella stuff this morning, guys. Come on, <laughs> let's stand and sing together this morning.
And I don't always get to see But I will believe it And I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To break prison walls And I will speak to my fears And I will preach to my doubt Then you were faithful then And you'll be faithful now I am standing on your word
Father, it's who you are. Yes, you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I will love you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Lord, you're perfect. So perfect in all of your ways Lord, you're perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways To us It's a love so Undeniable, I can hardly speak. Peace, so unexplainable, I can hardly think as you call me for deeper stills. Come on, do you feel you're calling you this morning? As you call me, so deeper still in the love, love, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. If you 
that you are God over all we know. But you're not surprised by anything. Now we ask that as we continue with the service and your word gets brought forth, that you would let it touch hearts and minds so that we can receive it, internalize it, and apply it to our lives. And we ask that in your name. Amen. Fear Factor Part 2. I spent some time this week just Googling different phobias. If you've never done that, it's, it's actually quite entertaining. And I, I know that I will botch the names of these because I tear up the King's English every day of my life anyway. So, but, but just kind of walk with me through some of these phobias that I thought, hey, these are, these are pretty interesting. Autophobia is the fear of being alone. Electorophobia. Electorophobia is the fear of chickens. Anybody afraid of a chicken? Some, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you've ever been chased by one of those dudes or being flogged by one of those dudes, you have a great fear of chickens, and I get that. Algophobia, the fear of pain. Bathmophobia. Now, that's not what 12-year-old boys have, okay? So I know you're thinking that right now. That's not it, okay? It's the fear of stairs. Maybe some of you in the room, you have this phobia. Epha biphobia. It's the fear of teenagers. <laughs> Maybe a lot in the house have this phobia. Majuri rockophobia. Because it's the fear of cooking. We live in a generation that no longer cooks. We fix things, right? There's a difference in there. Uh, the fear of cooking. This one I found very interesting is photophobia. It's not fear of having your picture made. It is the fear of having a phobia. So they covered it. They covered everything. The last one is the one that we're going to talk about today, antrophobia. Anthropophobia. The fear of people. The fear of people. Proverbs 29, verse 25. It says this, fear of men brings a snare but he who trusts in the lord will be exalted fear of men will prove as it's on your screen will prove to be a snare but whoever trusts in the lord will be exalted the number one yoke of fear on believers would be the bondage because the fear of man, because it is a deceptive spirit of fear. The deceptive spirit of fear puts you in one of two camps when we fear men. We, we become the people pleasers. Like if everybody doesn't like me and they don't like everything that I do, then I can't be happy because somebody doesn't like me. Understand, you will never please everybody. It's just, it's impossible. It's impossible to please everybody. The opposite camp that people get into when they have the fear of man on, not only, oh, I got to please everybody, and I got to be that people pleaser, and everybody's got to like me, and, 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 and all, and so on and so on. It would be the control freak. The control freak. And you go, well, I'm not really a control freak. I just have a very strong A-type personality. No, you're a control freak. That's what it means. Same thing. So we get into that point where we got to control everything around us. we got to control everybody around us. Proverbs 29, 25, still on your screen. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Snare is a trap. Actually, it's one of the most deceptive traps there is because it's hard to see. It's hard for an animal to uh, uh, elude that particular trap of a snare. That's why the, in Psalms it would say that you have rescued me from the snare, the trap of the hunter. That it's, we've been rescued from the snare or the trap of the devil. And fear is the false prophet spirit that gets placed on us, it's the yoke that gets placed on us as a bondage when we begin to fear men. The Bible speaks over and over again that we are not to have a spirit of fear, but so many believers carry that fear of humanity. They carry that fear of people, 
of what do people think. And it's the false prophet, meaning that it will tell you what your future looks like. It will tell you, hey, people are going to think this way of you, or people are not going to think this way of you, or people are going to say this about you, or people are going to look at you this way, or people are going to speak this way about you. They're going to talk about you behind your back. They're going to gossip about you, or they're going to act this way around you. Fear of people is actually the most mentioned fear from Genesis to Revelations. Oftentimes, when God would say, fear not, it would be, do not fear this particular nation. Do not fear this particular, particular people group. Do not fear this particular person or fear them. Why? Because if you live with the fear of man, you live in a world of the what ifs. Of what ifs. How many of you have not done things because you thought, what if? What if they make fun? What if they laugh? What if they reject? What if they talk? And then many of us in, in the room, we bear scars on our bodies because we did do something of what if. Well, what if they go back to class and they tell everybody, I wouldn't do that. So you know what? I'm going to be man enough and I'm going to step into that moment. And all of a sudden, 45 years later, it's hard to get out of bed some mornings because we did something stupid when we were 10, you know? And we bear scars of what if? what if. What if they don't accept me into that group? What if they don't like the way that I do things? And so we'll do these things. How many nights has what if kept you awake at night? How many times have you got up in the morning and the alarm clock in the morning was not the thing that said on the nightstand. The alarm clock was the sickening of your stomach because you woke up with what if? What is going to happen today? Moses was that way. Moses asked, what if? What if they don't like me? What if they laugh at me? What if they reject me? What if they don't accept me? What if they ask who sent me? Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5 says this. It says, I tell you, my friends. I tell you, my friends. He's talking to believers, and he says, hey, I want you to understand that as a child of God, that you are actually a friend of God. And most people never really think about that but we are friends of God do not be afraid of the one who can kill the body and after can do no more but I will show you whom you should fear fear him who after your body has been killed has the authority to throw it into hell yes you should fear him so what does fear do what does fear of man do to us well the number one thing it does is it snares us to a man it stares us to another human being. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 42, it says this, Yet at the that, at that same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear. They would be put out of the synagogue. For they love human praise more than the praises of God. It causes you to be bound to another human. It ensnares you to what other people would think of you, and it causes you to displace God to a different place of your life than where he should be, which is on the throne of your life, the center most part of your life. You're going, my, throne ha my life has a throne in it? Well, yeah, the simplest explanation would be in Isaiah 6, where it says, I saw him seated on the throne in the temple, and his robe filled the house. And so when you see temple in the Bible, it's referring to humanity. It's referring to us, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So there is a throne room of our life, and something will sit on that throne room of our life. And it would be that thing that would influence us, that thing that would speak to us, that thing whose rule we would follow, that thing whose standard we would follow, that thing whose morality we would follow, and whose speech that we would inherit in the moment, whose control we are under. Well, how do you know if you fall and pray to the yoke or the spirit of fear of man? Well, man becomes your meter of acceptance. It becomes that people-pleasing thing of, do they accept me as I am, and if they don't accept me, therefore I am a failure, or if this group doesn't accept me, I'm not a, I'm not a success in life. And it becomes your standard of success by how well people respond. 
how well people react. Now, and I believe we're, we're in some dangerous waters with, with, with the Instaperfect and the face brag and all that stuff that's out there because this generation, they think, hey, if I don't get 15 immediate posts of saying how much they like my particular crooked photo, have y'all noticed that? They're always turning their phone like this. and It's like, okay, if, if I don't get this... And if I don't get 15 of them within two minutes, people don't like me anymore. Or they don't retweet what I tweet or like what I tweet or give me the thumbs up or the smiley face or whatever it is on my status. Then, therefore, I'm a failure and I'm not a success in life anymore. And it becomes a very dangerous thing trying to live for the audience of men when we ought to live for the audience of one. Or your joy your happiness is based on the fickle feelings of your so-called friends. That if you can't have joy unless everybody else around you is joyful, that's not your source of joy. Your source of joy ought to come from God. You're always concerned about what they're thinking about you or what they're saying about you. Can I give you a reality check this morning and tell you more than likely they ain't thinking about you? They're just not. They've moved on to something else. You're, you're out of sight. You're out of mind. They're, they're not thinking about you. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. While they promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves to corruption, for by what a man overcame, by this he was enslaved. You're bound to somebody else. Do you realize that you are the worst version of you when you are bound to somebody else. Now, I'm not talking about in holy matrimony. That's a different thing. Okay, so don't get that wrong. But you're the worst version of you when you're bound by somebody else. You say, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, let's go back to elementary, maybe junior high days. When it came time for the three-legged race. You ever do a three-legged race? Three-legged race. You're tied leg to leg with somebody, your arms around their shoulder, their arms around your shoulder, and you're supposed to run. It doesn't matter how athletic you are, it doesn't matter how fast you are, it doesn't matter how big and bad you think you are, when you're bound to somebody else, you are slowed down. Do you agree with this? And sometimes they're dragging you or you're dragging them or you're falling flat on your face. And so it's one of those things when we get tied up in that moment, we're not there. We can't even walk well. Why? Because we're trying to walk in step with someone we were never supposed to be bound with and be in step with. We're to be in step only with God. Think about David. Old Testament David, you know the story. He goes out to face Goliath. He gets to the Israelite camp and finds that nobody has gone to face this champion warrior by Goliath, by the name of Goliath. He had been coming down into the valley for 40 solid days, taunting the Israelite army. And they're like, David, who do you think you are? David, that dude is huge down there. David, as a matter of fact, his armor weighs more than you do soaking wet with your robe on, boy. What are you thinking about? You cannot do this. There's a good reason nobody has gone down, David. The dude's huge. He is undefeated. We don't need to fight this man. It's, it's a bad scenario. And David's like, yeah, I know. I see him. And yeah, I know. I've heard the stories just like you do. And I know he's big. And I know he's bad. And I realize that everybody is standing back waiting on God to do something. But I tell you, I did not come searching for your help. I did not come searching for your word. I came with a word from the Lord God Almighty. I am ordained, I am anointed, and I am appointed for this time. Therefore, I will go against him in the name of the Lord my God. And he will deliver him. I know that I only got a sling, and I know that I'm only picking up five stones. Somebody said, well, why did he pick up five stones? Was he not confident? No, no, no. He was confident Goliath had four brothers. Come on, somebody. He was ready for them. Bring it on. But everybody was sitting back, waiting on God to move, and David said, no, I come in his name, and I'm the one that God has raised for this moment. Reminds me of the story of the floodwaters that started rushing through the town and 
A guy went out on his porch that was elevated, and he was on his porch, and the monster truck came through, and they said, come on, we'll take you to high ground. He said, no, God will deliver me. God will send a, some miracle. The floodwaters kept coming up, and the guy went into the second-story window of his house, and a boat came up and said, hop in, we'll take you to higher ground. He said, no, God will deliver me. God will send something for me. God will do the miracle. The waters kept rising. He's on his rooftop now. A helicopter flies over and screams down through the microphone, grab hold of the rope. We will fly you to safety. And he looked up and he said, no, go on. God will deliver me. He will bring me. He will do the miracle. The guy drowned. He stands before God. He's like, God, I don't understand. I said that you would send the miracle. And God said, dummy, I sent a monster truck, a boat, and a helicopter. What more do you want? See, sometimes God says, you move, you stand, you speak. Sometimes we need to stop praying and start acting and advancing things. Why? Because it is a fear of man that snares us to man. And it will take us away from God. It pulls you away from God. Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 54. It will pull us away from God, the fear of man. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed at a distance. Peter, I'll never leave you, God. Jesus, I am your right-hand man. Others may walk away, but not me. I'm strong. I'm right here. I'm standing beside you. And all of a sudden, he began to follow at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down with them, and a servant girl saw him seated in the firelight. And she looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I, I don't know him. A little later, someone else said to him, You are one of those. You're one of them. He said, Man, I'm not. About an hour later, another asserted certainly this fellow was with him for he is a Galilean and Peter replied man I don't know what you're talking about and just as he was speaking the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord before the rooster crows three times you will deny me and Peter went outside and he did what Wept what? Bitterly. Wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. That wordage is only used two times in Scripture. Only two men in Scripture, as far as I can tell. Now, biblical scholars may find some more, but I just, in my study time, this is what I found. That wordage is found two times. There were two people who went out and wept bitterly. And they were literally within a matter of hours of each other. The first one was Judas. The second was Peter. They went out and they wept bitterly. The look that Jesus gave in that moment, because you know that we, we speak a lot with our looks, don't we? Like a lot of us have learned to control our mouth, we just can't control our facial expressions, right? And that look was not one of, I told you so, Peter. And that look was not one of, you are such a dummy Peter and that look was not one of Peter get out of my sight I tell you that look was one of Peter you can come back it's open my arms are open wide for you Peter I will totally accept you and restore you what's that mean that means that you may have walked away from God and you may have feared man and been pulled away from God in the moment but he has not walked away from you listen to me my faith does not rest in my ability to hold on to God but rather his ability to hold on to me because he's got a better grip than I do and he said I'm communicating with you Peter that you can come back David in the Psalms said you will lead me and guide me with your eye upon me and maybe some of you need to see the Lord looking at you not in condemnation but in a way that hey believer you can come back you can come back 
Why? Because so many times over the years I've seen this played out where a believer gets caught up in something and all of a sudden they disappear. Why? Because they think there's a spirit of condemnation from God. It's not. God's a welcoming God. He's a loving God. He is a forgiving God. Come back. Come back. You can come back. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turned away from the Lord. Hey, let's look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. They're about to be thrown into the furnace. The furnace had never been heated up this hot before in the history of the furnace. The Bible says it was heated up seven times hotter than ever before. And they're like, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can still bow down to this statue this crazy king Nebuchadnezzar has erected. You can still bow down and worship the statue, and your life will be spared. This text proves a couple of things. One thing it proves is this, that weak, arrogant, crazy leaders have been around for a long, long, long time. That's what it proves. Nebuchadnezzar was weak, arrogant, and he was a crazy leader. And they turned it up. You can do this. You can walk away from it. You can, you can bow down right now. We'll give you another chance. And they said, the God we serve is able to deliver us. But even if he does not, we are not bowing down. And I think that's a word for the church of 2021. Don't bow down. Don't bow down. Stand. Stand firm and fight. The third thing fear of man does is it snares others through you. Because you're ensnared by the fear of men, others will be ensnared to you. John chapter 17, verse 13, four verses very quick, says, Yet no one was speaking openly for him for fear of the Jews. John 9, 22. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. John 19, verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. John 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and the disciples were hiding for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you why because these people were the most feared people on the planet they related everything that was happening to what they would do to them to how they would act toward them to how they would treat them and all of a sudden they became the people pleasers of the moment it was the outward show and so all this thing became a generational replica That because of fear of this group, we're going to hide. Because of fear of this group, we're not going to speak. Because of fear of this group, we're not going to worship. Because of fear of this group, we're not going to go to church. Because of fear of this, we're not going to stand. Because of fear of this group, we're not going to speak. And we even see this played out in modern days. Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, I will make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. You see, the fear-based relationship usually deteriorates into one of two situations. The first one is this, that you want to contain and control it. Contain and control. And control it. The only example that I could really think of right, right here. It, have have you ever um, been in the situation where the mouse or the rat is in the house? Now you got to control that situation, and you got to contain that joker. Why? Because there are people on the countertops, on the refrigerator, the washer, dryer, and every piece of furniture in the house at that moment, right, freaking out. Now, have you ever been in that same moment where the rat has been into the poison a little bit and it's drunk? 
Like when you're trying to contain in that moment, like this thing is counteracting what you're doing because it didn't, you know, it, I mean, it's just all over the place in that moment. And, you, and then all of a sudden you realize, hey, it went behind or under something and I can't get to it. And when you say you can't get to it, all of a sudden retreat mode happens throughout the house. It's like, strike a match. Let's go. We're out of here. You know, we can't get to this thing. It's bad. It's bad, and everybody wants to retreat and get out of the way and, and reject it and just know, we, and we forget the whole scenario. When it's based on fear of men, that's what happens. Here it is, Proverbs, oh not Proverbs, Psalms 27, verse 1. Psalms 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I fear? shall I be afraid? The Lord is my, what? Light. The Lord is my light of my salvation. Have you ever been in a dark room or awakened in a dark room and all of a sudden something catches your eye that freaks you out a little bit? And all of a sudden, you punt Teddy Rupskin across the room, right? You get freaked out about that, and all of a sudden, the kid's doll no longer has a head on it because you went full ninja mode on it. And it's like, oh, what was that? And you freak out in that moment, and you freak out in that moment because it's dark and you can't see clearly. But when the light comes on, you go, oh, it was just Teddy Rumpskin, or it was the kid's doll in the moment. We get freaked out over everything because things would come against us in the dark. But when the light reveals what it is, and we get freaked out over what humanity would think, what somebody might say, what somebody might, how somebody might act toward us, what somebody might say against us, what somebody might laugh at, what somebody might call us a name, what somebody might place a label on, and all of a sudden it becomes like that mask thing that freaks us out so bad. And we can't see it, we can't explain, uh, necessarily explain it, but all we know is there is a yoke of fear on us in that moment. But when the mask is snatched off and the light is turned on, all of a sudden we realize this is a moment of huge grace and opportunity for mercy over our life. Psalms 23, the most famous psalm of all, verse 6. You need to memorize Psalms 23, verse 6. You say, well, I've known that since I was a child, okay, let me tell you this. Take it to the next level and marinate in verse 6. Marinate in verse 6. Do you understand what marinating does? Marinating is you soak in it, right? How many of you agree that the marinate changes the meat? It changes the flavor. If you leave it in there long enough, it's going to change the texture. Like you leave chicken and marinate and Dale's marinate for like three days, it's like, like a brick like a hockey puck. It changes things. And we would usually just let this marinate over your life. Psalms 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy. Now, if you learned it a long time ago, the word is loving kindness. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Loving kindness, mercy, really interchangeable words here. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's the big brothers that we get as a Christian. They follow us, the goodness of God, the mercy of God. Therefore, we don't have to worry about what the world might say about us. We don't have to worry about what, the, what humanity might say about us, what they might think about us, what they might speak to us. Why? Because we got some goodness and we got some mercy following us. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your great love, God, your incredible mercy over our life, your great grace. And Father, thank you that we do not have to fear but, Father, we can walk in the light of your truth and in the light of your word. And, Father God, I'm grateful for that. And, Father, I pray, Father God, that you would just allow that to marinate over our lives, that your goodness and your mercy, they will follow us all the days of our lives. And maybe you're here this morning, and you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but this will be the day. That you say, you know what, I, I need to know Jesus in a personal way. I need to know him as my Savior and as my Lord. If that's you, in just a moment we're going to stand. and We're going to begin to worship and just invite you to 
come to one of us here at the front. We'll gladly share Jesus with you and how you can know him. Maybe there's other prayer needs, prayer concerns. It's always a privilege and a joy to pray with you and for you. I want you to understand the altar is always open. If you just need to come and do business, it's you and God. That's perfectly fine. The only thing we ask is that if you need to know Jesus today or you need to come for prayer today, that you don't wait. That just as we stand right now, if you need to come, that you would come. The mountains they must fall and they fall. You tell oceans to be still and they're calm. You tell sickness. Trunk or Treat, Music Hall of Fame. If you're hosting a trunk, please be there by about 120. That will help us out. There will be X's. Where the X's are, that's where you park, okay, for the Trunk or Treat. That will help us out. That way we can have them properly spaced out so it will be a smooth flow. Somebody said, hey, I, I, I want to host a trunk, but I didn't sign up. That's great, host a trunk. And then somebody else said, hey, I went to get candy, and like Walmart already had Christmas candy out, to which I'm like, Reese Trees taste the same as Reese Pumpkins. It's all good, amen? It's okay. If you get Christmas candy, it's all right. Not a problem at all. Uh, so if you're hosting a trunk, please be there by 120. Park in the spot that is X'd off for you to park in. We'll be over there directing traffic for you. Our staff will uh, to help you out with that. As always, you can give online, text to give, uh, give in the wall slots, or give at the Connect Desk. We thank you for your faithfulness in that. We look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Have a great Sunday.